Well, good morning. It was 4.49 a.m. this morning when I finally just opened my eyes up and looked at the clock. I've been laying there for a little bit today, this, you know, before I started my day, just talking to God, half awake, half asleep about the message. And I was making sure, Father, is this what you want me to say? And then not only is this what you want me to say, how do you want me to say that? I'm going to be funny when I say that. I'm going to be serious when I say that. And I do that a lot. When in, at 449, a sense of urgency hit me concerning the message. A, a, an urgency that this is something that somebody's got to hear. And I needed to get up and pray about it. Now, I don't know exactly which ones of you and what's going on in your life that would, might cause an urgency to hear this word this morning. But you cost me some sleep last night. <laughs> so this morning, as I give you this message, I want you to know that uh, I believe it's one that uh, God's going to use in your life in a great and a powerful way. And maybe if it misses you, it's going to catch somebody uh, sitting right beside you. So let me talk to the Father again. God, I love you. And Father, I do pray that you give me right words to say the way you want me to say them. I pray, Father, as you have blanketed this room with your precious Holy Spirit's presence, that right now you would capture the attention, the thoughts, the minds, and speak into the lives of every person that is here. Father, I pray right now that you would do a great and a mighty work. Wow, what happened at nine? Wow. And God, I just pray that you do something special in this service today. So there has been an urgency in my spirit concerning delivering this message from you. And I know you know exactly who it's for. So Father, don't let anything distract your word getting into their life and their heart. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the bell is rung. It's round one. You normally don't have to tell a Christian that they're in a fight. Christians don't need to be reminded that we have an enemy. The enemy's name is Satan, Lucifer, the devil. He was an angel created by God who was cast out of heaven because he thought he could be equal with God. With him came one-third of all the angels that God created, angels, powerful beings. They're able to travel. They're able to, to war. They're able to do many, many, many different things in the spiritual realm as well as in the physical realm. And because Satan is not omnipresent like God, he cannot be everywhere at one time. He can't be at your house and my house too. He can't be, you know, in Washington and be in Colorado. Satan can only be at one place at one time. Therefore, he dispatches his demons, those fallen angels we know as demons. They set up a military strategy in different parts of a region where they come after the kingdom work of God being done. They come after churches. They come after families. They come after individuals. They come after your kids. And they are no respecter of persons. They're no respecter of anybody's individual age. They will attack anybody, and they will do so as long as it takes to knock you out, to keep you down, to make you understand that you are in a fight that they want you to believe that you cannot win. You don't have to tell men this. Men know that we have fights, we have struggles, we have challenges. You put men in a room, close the door where it's only men, hand them a microphone, let them talk for a little while, and they'll tell you about their struggles. They'll tell you about the struggles that's going on in their own mind. They'll tell you about the struggles that's happening in their thought life. They're wanting to be godly men. They're wanting to be worshipers, and yet they'll be in a worship service, and all of a sudden an image will come across their mind in a worship service that they that discuss themselves. They'll tell you about the challenges they face, the temptations that they deal with. They'll tell you how the enemy is hitting their self-esteem, their self-worth, how it's constant, the enemy's constantly telling them that we're not good enough, constantly telling us that we can't accomplish what we want to accomplish, that we're probably going to fail, and we're never going to get our family to the dreams in which God put in our heart for our family, for our marriage, for our finances. Now, you women are no different. You face challenges, too. You face the same similar fight, fights that's going on in your mind, the enemy telling you things that there's no physical proof to what you're thinking at all. You find fights and battles that will go on concerning your emotions, where your emotions are high or they're low, or sometimes they're level, but the enemy is constantly going after you. And the truth of the matter about some of you women, if we all just got real honest and kept it real, is there are women in here, truthfully, you are one more bad relationship away from owning 20 cats. <laughs> you are this close to being the crazy cat lady who has named all of your cats after ex-boyfriends going all the way back to middle school. Charlie, come over here. Why don't you come over here? I can control your food. I can kill you if I want. I mean, you just, you're that close to being crazy, right? 
So the enemy knows how to go after you. He goes after men. He goes after women. He is no respecter of persons. As I walked around the worship center this morning, I see people here of all ages. And even those of you that are over 70 years of age, 75, some in our first service, over 80, you're still up under attack. The truth is, here it is, you're in a fight. You will be in that fight for the rest of your life. You go, well, why would the devil pick on a gray-headed old 80-year-old? I'll tell you why. He's after your prayer life. He doesn't want you praying for your kids, doesn't want you praying for your grandkids, doesn't want you lifting up or naming your great-grandkids before the Heavenly Father day after day after day. So he wants to rack your mind with thoughts like, will my money run out before my life runs out? There's always a battle going on in your life. You will be in a fight forever. I'm sorry to tell you that you will never be able to get out of it as long as you are on this planet. You are in a war. Now, you say, well, you know, I'm a child of God. It shouldn't be that way. God said he had an enemy, therefore you have an enemy. And we blame a lot of things on God. We want to throw a lot of credit, you know, his way when it comes to bad things happening. But he said we had an enemy. We don't think that way in any other spectrum of our life. You wouldn't go to certain countries in, in, on this planet and just wave a United States flag, wear a big United States you know, flag shirt, and tell people that you're an American. There are some places where you go, because you're an American, you automatically have an enemy. So you'd play a lower profile, or you wouldn't go to that place at all. Well, just like we as Americans have enemies, we as Christians have enemies. It's just a fact of life. It is just the way it is. But God is very clear in telling us that, and we will face that enemy all of our life. Now, when you accept Christ as your personal Savior, it allows you to have a home forever in heaven. You have a trusted friend in Jesus Christ, and it is amazing. But when you accept Christ as your personal Savior, it also allows you to enter into doing life in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is your guide for this tour of duty. He will stand with you. He will be with you. He will equip you. He will encourage you. And he will go in the battle with you. Now, to be honest with you, as your pastor, I just got to just keep it real, being a, just a husband, a man, you know, father, grandfather, and all that stuff. Uh, there are days I don't want to fight. There are days that I just pray, God, please, can I go through one day without conflict of some kind? How about an hour, Lord? Can you give me an hour, one hour without conflict? There are times that I get tired, that I get weary, that I get beat down, and the truth of the matter is the last thing that I want in that day or that week or that month or that year is another fight. But there are other times I love the fight. There are other times that I feel like I'm winning, that I'm pushing back the enemy. There are other times that I feel like I'm getting the advantage. There are other times I feel like I'm powered up. There are other times that I'm energized where I say, bring it on. It is on. You mess with the wrong dog today, it is on. But that's not every day. Some days I like to fight, some days I don't. But here is the consistency that I see when it comes to this battle that we're in in the flesh toward, this, toward spiritual things, toward an enemy called Satan and demons. The consistent thing is that the fight comes to us in rounds. There is a beginning. There is an end. There is a rest period. And then there is a new round, which has a beginning and an end and a rest period, and then another round. And even there's consistency when it comes to the rounds. They're not all the same. Sometimes you're on top, and sometimes things are going good, and the job's good, and the wife's good, and everybody's acting great, and the husband, he's real sweet that day, and, and everything's going, and your money's good, and things are great. Other times it feels like the enemy's got you back on the ropes. And you're not sure you can take another hit, and you're just trying to cover up. You're just trying to get through it. Other times you're down. And the enemy's over you, taunting you, saying, you better stay down. Don't you get back up. You want more of this, you get back up. He's saying, you, you've had enough. Just stay down, throw in the towel. And your tendency is to go ahead and let your eyes roll back in your head and say, it's enough. I'm hurt enough. I'm down enough. I'm beat enough. This round, and it's over. But something kicks in when that happens where you say, there's too much at stake here. There's too much to risk. And so you just hang on. You watch the bell. You're getting kicked in the side. Everything's going wrong. And you're just waiting. And the bell's going to ring. The bell's going to ring. I, I can make it to the bell. And you take hit after hit after hit. If I can just get out of this round, if I can just get throw, through it, I'm not, I'm not giving in. I'm not going to quit. Bing, bing, bing. And all of a sudden, you're crawling back to your friend. 
morning. There your trainer meets you. Trainer looks you in the face and says, you all right. You're bleeding, you're hurt, you're bloody. The trainer's talking to you and you're listening to the trainer. And the trainer tells you, hey, you can win this. And something down inside of you musters it up that I, this isn't fight, this isn't for me. But this is for my wife. This is for my husband. This is for my kids. This is for my grandkids. I'm not going to leave them unprotected when it comes to prayer. I'm going to fight on. So you stand. That's all you got. You're just standing. You're waiting during that rest period for the next bell to ring, and your trainer looks at you and goes, you going back in? Yes, sir. And he says, really? And you say, yes, sir. And he says this. He says, well, then, let me see your hands. And he grabs your hands. They're bloody. And he puts a set of brass knuckles on both of them. He says, there you go. And he says, you're getting hit hard right here. Let me put, let me put a bulletproof vest on you right there. It'll stop some of the blows. And he said, I noticed you've been down a lot. Let me put some steel-plated knee pads on you right there. You can use that against the enemy. Let me put some steel toe shoes on you. I'll put some steel toe. And your face isn't looking too good right now. I'm going to put a football helmet on your head, put a face mask on your face. I'm going to put a can of mace in your back pocket. Oh, and by the way, I'm going in this round with you. I've always been a, a friend of the underdog. I always like the story of somebody who's been down and out for a period of time to come back. I always like to see somebody that everybody else gave up on rise to a level that is beyond what everybody else is who gave up on them. And it is in 1 Samuel chapter 30 we have the story of David. David was a go-fetch-it boy. David was a boy that, 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 that you take some sandwiches to your brothers, but don't get in their way. David was a watch-the-sheep, babysit-the-sheep kind of a guy. But yet God said he's a man after my own heart. Interesting. God said he's a man when he was still a boy. You know why? Because God will speak prophecy into your future when you are still struggling with and dealing with your past. David was a man that was in serious trouble. But God stepped beside him and said, I'm going to bless you. Not just bless you, but I'm going to blow your mind and make you the king. I'm going to take you from a very low place and take you to a very high place because you've got a heart, a good heart that's after me. Paul had a heart for God. David had a heart for God. Jeremiah had a heart for God. It didn't matter what their situation was. It didn't matter their education or their background. If God saw a good heart in them, a Tim Tebow heart, a fully committed, all out from me kind of a guy heart or a woman's heart for him, God blesses that kind of person. So it's this David that we see in this story who had been with 600 men. Now think about it. David's about to become king one day. He's hiding out because Saul wants to kill him. He's got 600 fighting soldiers. These were roughnecks. I mean, these, these were like oil field roughnecks. They, they did, these weren't like polished soldiers. They were like Snoop Dogg, you know, and, you know, and, and, and Bojo, you know, and Willie. I mean, he didn't have, you know, the polished soldiers. These were just these are good old boys, but they fight. So 600 of them with their wives and their children living in a town called Ziglag where David's two wives and his children were also. They go off to fight the Philistines, which were a bold group of men that fought against, this, you know, from, well, this is where from, uh, Goliath came from, it, it, it fought against the children of God. So after a war, it takes them three days to come back home to their wives and kids. So the men are on their way back home, as you would imagine, thinking, I'm almost smelling some barbecue tonight on the grill. The kids are going to be meeting me in the street, hugging my legs. It's going to be a party with the wife tonight. It's going to be a night. Here's the story. Three days later, when David and his men arrived home from their town in Ziglag, they found that Amalekites had made a raid on the Negev and Ziglag. They had crushed Ziglag and they burned it to the ground. They had carried off the women and the children and everyone else, but without killing anyone. When David and his men saw the ruins and realized what had happened to their families, they wept until they could weep no more. David's two wives were among the captured. David was now in great danger because all the men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters. And they began talking about stoning him. We've got to blame somebody. But David found strength in the Lord his God. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David asked the Lord, should I chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? 
And the Lord told him, yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that is taken from you. So David and his 600 men set out, and they came to a brook, Bizar. But 200 of the men were too exhausted to cross the brook. So David continued in pursuit with 400 men. Along the way, they found an Egyptian man in a field, and they brought him to David. They gave him some bread to eat and some water to drink. They also gave him a part of a fig cake, two clusters of raisins, for he hadn't eaten anything for about three days and nights. Before long, his strength returned. To whom do you belong and where do you come from, David asked him. He said, I'm an Egyptian. I'm a slave of an Amalekite, he replied. My master abandoned me three days ago because I was sick. Sounds like a nice master. We were on our way back from raiding the, the, the Jerethites in the Negev and the territory of Judah and the land of Caleb. Oh, we also burned Ziglag. Well, right there, men, hang on for a second. How many of you think David had to keep his men from killing him? You understand what he just said? Oh, yeah, by the way, I burned your village. Are you with me? We took your wives. Will you lead me to this band of raiders, David asked. Now, this is a very important question because David's going to run him through if he, if he says anything but yes. The man replied, if you take an oath in God's name that you will not kill me or give me back to my master, then I'll guide you to them. So, David, so he led David to them, and they found the Amalekites spread out across the fields, eating and drinking and dancing with joy because of the vast amount of plunder that they had taken from the Philistines and from the land of Judah, which is where Ziglag was. David and his men rushed in among them, slaughtered them throughout the night, and the entire next day until evening, a 24-hour battle. None of the Amalekites escaped except 400 young men that fled on camels. Now, David only had 400 men, so I don't know how many they killed, but 400 he let go. So just young guys, he just let them get out of there. David got back everything the Amalekites had taken, and he rescued, oh, everybody say rescue, rescue. his two wives. Nothing was missing, small or great, son or daughter, nor anything else that had been taken. David brought everything back. Well, for you know a little bit about David, David was a, a shepherd boy. David was a, a guy that wrote psalms. David was a harp player. David was a singer. David was a dance in the street, dancing with the stars kind of guy. But he was also a warrior. Don't let his poetry, don't let his soft heart, don't let his worship spirit, don't let how he would act in a worship service like what we had in here confuse you concerning who David was. David was balanced. David would walk out in the middle of the field taking his brother some sandwiches and, and a giant could be uh, demanding or, or, or spewing out hatred toward his almighty God. And David said, I'll fight you myself. Climbed off his bicycle, so to speak, went out there and took out a giant. Later on in David's life, he killed 200 Philistines through their foreskins at the feet of Saul and said, who else needs to die today? Point me at him. So don't confuse the balance of David's meekness with David's power. David was a powerful man. He was a good man. He was a forceful man in a bad situation. But never underestimate a good woman or a good man while they're going through a bad situation. Never overlook a good man or a good woman or a good teenager when they're going through something difficult because they're not going to stay there. The Bible goes on to tell us that David David uh, went to the Lord. Well, first of all, David was living in Zeglag. He'd been there for one year and four months. His wives, his 600 men, all of their families, they'd taken over this town. He goes out to flight the Philistines. The enemy comes in, takes away the love of their lives. By the way, the enemy was the Amalekites. They were not the Philistines. The Amalekites were different than the Philistines. A Philistine would stand face to face with you and say, best man lives. The Amalekites would never stand face to face with David's soldiers. The Amalekites were sneaky. They were tricky. They would only attack you in a place of your vulnerability. They would attack your weakness. So they attacked and took the children and took the kids, breaking the heart, breaking the spirit of David's men so that they wouldn't have the strength to do anything about it. Ziglag represents a place to where when you are fighting one thing, something else comes against you. Well, let's see if anybody can relate to that. Have you ever been in a place in your life to where when you are fighting one thing, exhausted, all the resources going into it, almost see the end of the tunnel, but you're certainly not done with it yet, you're just exhausted, throwing, if one more thing happens, and boom, 
one more thing does happen. Ziglag represents that place in your life. It's not a good place to where when you're fighting one thing, another thing rises up against you. I don't know about you, but until you've been in a fight, you really don't understand how exhausting a fight can be. I mean, even if you win, which David was accustomed to doing, fighting can be exhausting. Sometimes you can be a winner and still be wounded. wounded. Sometimes you can win and still be tired. You can survive and still be weary. You can overcome a divorce and still be exhausted from overcoming and even winning in that divorce relationship, if there is one. There's winning. Winning will always cost you something. You know, if you fail, if you, if you don't succeed, it's fatal. I mean, it's over. You don't have anything else to do but to go on to the next thing. But when you win... Sometimes you can be so exhausted from the win that you don't have the strength to enjoy that which you won in the battle. Anybody tracking with me? That's why when the men came home, they were coming home to a place of comfort, but they found a place of conflict instead. Have you ever wanted comfort and found conflict? Have you, I need some comfort, but there was conflict. Can I have a little comfort, but there's conflict? This is why the enemy will always come against your home. There are two places the enemy will attack. The enemy will never attack Taco Bell. Boston's. The enemy's not attacking them all. Just so you know, her burgers, is it still there? Okay, it's okay. Okay, it's okay. All right? The enemy will attack your home because the home is a place where you come for comfort. And when there is conflict within the home, then you do not receive restoring, restoration, restoration. And the last thing the enemy wants you to have is rest, a place where you can receive comfort. That's why the enemy will attack your church. Now, he may not physically be able to get to the church, but if he can get to your mind or your relationship concerning your church, where you're not being fed good messages to be able to fight with, then all of a sudden he's attacked the place where you come for comfort, for restoration. He's messed you up with a relationship that is so important in your life to give you comfort and restoration. Somebody you see in the church, ticked you off or the pastor said whatever but it's all a ploy from the enemy to get you at a place where your home feels conflicted and your church feels conflicted and what's so important about this what's so important about this is that that the men went on to say that they wanted to kill David they said now now all of a sudden David David lost his his wife he just went to battle he's exhausted three-day trip home hoping for comfort he's lost his wife like they did he's lost his kids and now his brothers and friends turn against him. Now he's got an enemy in a strange place. I mean, I don't mind enemies in places where I expect enemies, but have you ever had an enemy in a strange place? Have you ever come home and there's a grown son or a grown daughter that the devil is now using as an enemy against your life? Have you ever had a wife or a husband freak out on you a day, day and a half, two days, where they were completely out of character, and all of a sudden you have an enemy and a spouse in a strange place? Nothing will make you feel more alone on this planet until you have had an enemy in a strange place in your life. So David's feeling alone. He's under attack. He thinks his life's going to be over. He's lost his wife, his kids. Everyone that believed in him has turned against him. And then the Bible says, so David encouraged himself in the Lord. Listen very carefully to what I'm about to tell you. I don't care if you're married. I don't care if you're not married. It basically one day always comes back to this fact. It is you and God against this world. Never forget that. There's always going to be a time in your life when you feel isolated and alone and an enemy is within your home and you have to either leave it or hit your knees and fight with it. David, the Bible said, encouraged himself in the Lord. David, David, had, a, David had a strength in himself in a gym. No, not a gym, but he still had to work out. He had to work, he had to work some stuff out. Oh, wait a minute, what's that look like? He strengthens himself like, i gotta, I got to work some, where, I, Lord, God, I'm yours. I'm still yours. I still love you. You promised blessings on my life. This doesn't look like the abundant life you promised. This can't be from your hand. You said your plans are to prospering me, not to harm me. This is harm. This is devastating. And if you wanted me dead, my men wouldn't have had to do it. I was a boy when a lion came and a boy when a bear came after those sheep. They could have ate me in the field. 
That giant you sent me in there after could have killed me. You didn't give me this stuff to be taken away by the enemy. They're not your kids. You hate those people and they hate you. So what are we doing about this? And he was, remi- let me tell you something, good teaching will take you places where nothing else on this planet will take you. So David stood up. Now this is what's puzzling to me, but I love it. Then David goes, you want me to go get him? Okay, man, man, a van pulls up in front of your house, abducts your wife and your kids. They're headed that way, okay? Do you call me up and say, hey, pastor, you think I ought to go get him? Do you call the police and say, hey, please, they just ran all my way again. You think on it? No, you use the cell phone on the way, right? You're 110 miles an hour. Everybody better get out of your way. You're chasing a van. Am I right or am I not right? Okay, okay. David goes, you want me to go get him? David consulted God with the obvious, yes or no? All right, now let me tell you why. Because when it comes to the spiritual warfare going on in your life, nothing is obvious and David knew that so he said Lord we can do this any way you want to do it do you want me in now he could have said Lord they took him away I know that's not the will of God so bring him back matter of fact God why don't you just take all those enemies hearts stop right now where they're at let them fall dead in the field and let since we're tired let the wives and the kids walk back home sound like a plan no this is what God said uh Go get them. You'll bring them all back. So with this word that David's going to win, David said, guys, we're going after our wives and family. They, now they had a purpose and a plan. It was to get up, stop whining, and become warriors again. They get up, they go after the family, and as they do, 200 of them hit a brook, and they go, we're exhausted. We can't go any further. David says, all right, you 200 stay here. Stay with the equipment, stay with the luggage. Us 400 to go on. Listen to me. You can't take everybody with you sometimes. But listen closely to what I'm about to say. Everybody can't go with you sometimes. Because not everybody realizes that life means you face disappointment after disappointment after disappointment after disappointment, and you still strengthen yourself in the Lord. You get back up. You get in the fight. There's too much at risk, and I will go on with you or without you. I'm going to go on for the blessed life that God wants me to have, and I'm not apologizing to anybody for it because this is what David did. When David finally got it all back, those that were too weak to go on were blessed as well. Now watch what happens. The Bible says David goes in and the fight lasts from daylight till from dark till the next day at dark. But the Bible says David brought everything back. They hit the brook, the 200 men rejoice, the families are all there. Everybody's good. Because God's will was disguised in sweat, in blood, in preparation, in tears, in exhaustion, in turmoil, in fight, and then celebration. I like this quote. It says, most people do not recognize success because it is disguised in overalls and it smells like work. Well, pastor, I thought it was God's will. This would be easier. God, if you knew all those Amalekites were going to die, why didn't you just kill them? Why not? And let me, because I've been good, I've been faithful. God is like a trainer. He'll go into the fight with you when he knows you're going back in. Right? When he knows. When David brought all the spoils back, the men started singing a song that says, all of this belongs to David. The men needed a hero that day. And David stepped up and said, we're getting our stuff back. 
the women, smart, intelligent, strong, wonderful women, needed a hero that day. And here come their men. Man. Gives me, that gives me goosebumps. Those children needed a hero that day. And here comes their daddies. Because they were in a fight where they were being defeated. And somebody has got to man up in the power of God and stop whining and stop crying and get a second breath and encourage yourself in the Lord and go in there and get back what the enemy has taken from you. We need heroes in our family. Your family member doesn't have to be gone physically to be gone. They could be gone spiritually, no longer in a worship service with you, worshiping and loving on their Heavenly Father, and they're just as much gone. They can be gone socially and no longer connecting with somebody in the family of Christ, investing into them, having that invested back into them. Instead, connecting with people that don't even know their God on their work because they have their heart broken or they lack forgiveness in the hearts of, towards somebody else in their church, and they're still just as much gone. Your family needs a hero, somebody who will hit their knees when you are totally exhausted and encourage themselves in the Lord Jesus Christ. This doesn't look like the abundant life you've been talking about. Your plans are to prosper me, not to harm me. The devil's taking stuff that doesn't belong to him. It belongs to me. Reminder, when David got to the brook, 200 of the 600 stopped and couldn't go forward. David lost a third of his soldiers going into battle. Some of you have less right now than what you've had in years. And you're going to do more with less than you've ever done with more in your past. David got it all back. Would you stand with me, please? I want the people in here that are responsible for me being up at 4.49 a.m. this morning to please come down to the front right now. Come on. Come on down here. Show yourself. <laughs> You're forgiven. I'm sorry you guys have had to be in a fight because the Amalekite enemy didn't play fair. There are weaknesses that you have in your life like I do. And the enemy knows, knows what buttons to push. You start talking smack, talking all tough. He'll remind you of something that will shut you up. He will. He sucks like that. Uh, and there are times that, seriously, you will feel totally exhausted. So beat up, so tired. You'll say things like this, God, seriously, I'd rather you just take me home than for me to be hit with one more thing right now. I, I do not, I do not have it in me. This conflict at home, the church doesn't feel like it should. It's, fun, it's all funked up. I don't know what's going on with it. It's funky. And there's no place where I can get rest. I call my friends up. They think I, I caused this myself. And 
mean to. And then it's just you and him again. And like a trainer, he says, you're all right. I made you. I know how I made you. I know how tough you are. I know what you can take. I told you I wasn't going to give you something you couldn't take. I know how tough you are. The only way you know how tough you are is to deal with something you think you can't deal with. Then you go, oh, whoa, 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 look at that. Are you going back in? Are you? Would you like some help? Set of brass knuckles this time. Can of mace, little vest, headgear, steel toe boots. How about a bazooka? You want to just win it, survive it, or you want to annihilate it, move forward? That's the Holy Spirit. And all he wants to know is, are you going back in? David said, God, should I go? Will I, will I take him? The verse I sent you this week said, I am the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? Is recovering everything that you've lost with less going after it possible for God? Is blessing you beyond your imagination outside of God's will for your life? He's just looking for one thing. He's just looking for one thing from you. Are you going back into the fight? And if you are, if you are with this determination, I will never quit. Disappointment after disappointment after disappointment after disappointment. Blood, sweat, tears, crying, fighting, spitting, losing my hair, whatever. I am in this. Father God, I love you so much, and I know what it's like to be exhausted, to be beat up, to be down, to be intimidated by the enemy's voice speaking into our mind, into our ears, the battle never stopping 24-7. But God, what's at stake here is children. What's at stake here is a marriage. What's at stake here is a family. And where my family has needed a hero, I've been a coward. I didn't mean to be a coward, but exhaustion and pain loneliness will turn a coward make a coward out of any good man any good woman but I'm crawling back over to my corner I'm waiting for the next bell to ring and if that bell's going to ring at work, at home, in my finances in a relationship let it ring because I'm going back in to get what the enemy's taken from me my family needs a hero tattoo it on my chest because here I go in Jesus name amen Woo! I love y'all hey round two next week we'll see you then